Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you are doing well. Uh, first of all, thank you for joining us today. My name is Zubair bin Naim, and I'm an Education USA Advisor at USCFP based in the Islamabad office. Today, we have a Fulbright alumni joining with us. His name is Tala Zahur. He has a master's in electrical power system management from North Carolina State University. Um, and he's going to be talking to us about his Fulbright journey. All right. So today, before we start, a little bit about who we are. Uh, USCFP, or the United States Educational Foundation Pakistan, is the Fulbright Commission in Pakistan. USCF, USCFP promotes mutual understanding between the people of Pakistan and the people of the United States through educational and cultural exchange. To learn more about our organization, programs, and facilities, you can check out our website at www.usefp.org. Um, a quick note before I hand it over to a present uh, before I hand it over to a presenter, we'll be taking questions at the end of the session. Uh, for your questions, please go ahead and drop your questions in the in the Q and A box at the bottom, and then near the end of the session, Mr. Tala will be go uh, going and addressing those questions. All right. So before we go to the question and answer sessions uh, near the end, we're just going to start off with the some basic questions, right? So Tala, uh, I'm going to hand it over to you now. Uh, but before, uh, maybe you can start off at telling us about how exactly did you embark on this this uh, pathway of on this path of Fulbright? Okay, thank you, uh, Lubar. So uh, I'll start with the with a little bit of background. Um, I uh, have actually completed my bachelor's uh, from Pakistan Institute of Engineering and Applied Sciences, also known as PERAS, uh, from 2012 to 2016 in uh, electrical engineering. Um, after that, I actually worked for, for a year uh, in Pakistan, and then I decided to apply for, for Fulbright. And uh, I applied in 2017, and my Fulbright year was 2018 to 2020. Uh, for a master's program in North Carolina State University uh, under the program named uh, Electric Power Systems Engineering. Uh, so the, the journey has actually started in the university time when we came across the USCFP um, because uh, of the seminar that has been held at our university for, for the global UGRAD program or it was uh, for the uh, for the Fulbright program. So we get to know about uh, a lot of information from there. And uh, then I decided to apply um, um, in 2017 after giving, uh, giving my GRE exam. And uh, yeah, I got selected. And uh, yeah, the journey started from uh, 2018 uh, to going to the North Carolina. And uh, yeah, it was an amazing time uh, going, uh, learning about, uh, uh, about the US culture and at the same time getting education in one of the best institutes in the world. So yeah. All right, that's uh, that's wonderful. Um, so, can you just uh, tell everyone about a, a bit about about what the Fulbright application is? What what is what is it like navigating the Fulbright application in terms of how do you apply? In terms of um, what was your profile like um, that you got selected for the Fulbright application? Share a little bit about your profile. Okay. Yeah, the Fulbright uh, application is a. Uh... Uh, yeah, just the basic application, but uh, apart from that, the most important factor which needs to be considered, um, uh, one is GRE exam, which you have to be, uh, uh, which you have to give before, uh, uh, before applying. And some, in some cases, they also allow you to have the, uh, the, the result before, uh, after that close application as well, but you can send the, send the results later. You just have to take the exam uh, uh, before, the, before the end of the, of the application. Uh, that was, I think, in my time, that was the case. Uh, I hope the, I hope so. The same is uh, is now. Um, the second uh, two two other things which are very important of, uh, for the application is the personal statement and the study objectives. Uh, I remember when I was applying uh, at that time, I uh, I had a conversation with some of the other Fulbright uh, alumni, and the best advice I got is uh, be natural, uh, write what you have gone through in your life. Uh, uh, tell a little bit about your personal journey journey in the in the personal statement and in the study objective try to be as elaborative about what you want to achieve once you completed your degree and what's your objectives are during the course of study in the US. So from that perspective, I would say that uh, writing a personal statement would be I have divided into three three parts. 
Uh, one is the uh, is the historical uh, history of of my of my education and uh, uh, the development of my uh, of, of my education and as well as my personal life. Um, then I also incorporated a little bit of motivation of why I'm applying in the full drive and then concluding the whole resume on a whole person statement on the on the point that what I will bring out of this experience and contribute to the society. Um, and uh, I, I write down my personal statements uh, a couple of times, uh, proofread it up a couple of times, uh, um, get some advice from the from my seniors or from my from my colleagues uh, or my teachers at that time. So that was helpful, and uh, following that was a study objective. And in the study objective, because I was going for an electrical power system engineering program, and I, my main focus was to learning about the new uh, and efficient ways of producing electricity. Um, following that, uh, either it be from the renewables energy technology, or it will be from the from the clean energy initiatives, or it would be from the uh, microfiber power plants. So all these keeping in mind, my my study objective was mostly uh, focusing on the perspective that. How we can reduce the problems of energy de uh, deficiency in Pakistan and the energy crisis we were going through, and and how we can get uh, get rid of it, and what are the most efficient ways uh, uh, to produce electricity given the situations of Pakistan, um, and also co considering the fact of how the world is becoming green and uh, how the car uh, the countries are trying to reduce the carbon footprint in that direction. How we can how I can learn the more. Uh, advanced technology is going through in the renewable technologies and uh, you know, that would be solar or wind power plants uh, and or biomethane and then in that direction how, what are the new discoveries and new inventions are happening so that was very important for me to, uh, to learn so that is the key aspects i take in, taken into consideration in writing my study objectives so i would say if you are writing a study objective my only advice would be that to uh, to Apply for the for, for the uh, to apply or uh, your your education or your uh, or your past education or your uh, or your potential degree into the into the field where there is a need of invention or the, uh, or the need of delivering something concrete for the development of Pakistan. There are uh, some uh, most of the time in Kuwait there are specific educational uh, degrees or you can say uh, programs that are given high priority. At that time of the year, when I was applying, energy is one was one of the most uh, uh, important uh, uh, study programs that needs to be considered. Um, and my degree was aligning with that, and my interest was, was aligning with that. And uh, yeah, so that's why uh, my study objective was very focused on what I wanted to achieve out of the program and what I wanted to do after the program. Um, so yeah, having said that, um, I would say uh, the study objective and personal statements were the uh, main key points for me. Uh, going for uh, going for my application and trying to keep the most focus on and following that was the reference letters and the reference letters I got uh, from my uh, one one of one from my employee and uh, where I was working and a couple of them from my from my teacher uh, they registered it. so they actually can give like, give you a glowing recommendation on uh, what you have done in the past what your ambitions are and would they align with what you are doing and what you wanted to do in future. So that actually helps you a lot in uh, shaping the shaping the application in the right direction. Um, yeah. Uh, apart from that, uh, yeah, as I said, GRE, the personal statement, SOP, and reference letters were the most key points. And then you have to fill out the uh, the whole application on the USCFP website and yeah, send uh, send it uh, via online, and then yeah, the whole process uh, uh, is is pretty much like that. All right. So uh, before we move on to some of the other questions, um, you spoke a little bit about personal statement and we have a good question in the chat box here. Um, and the, one of the audience members is asking, what if, what about if we use chat GPT or other AI tools for personal statement writing? How would you advise them? Like, should they be completely dependent on it, completely independent of it, of it or have somewhat of a hybrid mixture? Um, regarding AI or other tools like ChatGPT for a personal statement regarding the Fulbright program. Um, a good question. Uh, uh, so at that time, when I was applying, ChatGPT was not there. But with the event of technology, like right now, we are in the in the era where we can write a lot of like resume, personal statements, or cover letters uh, with the help of ChatGPT. I would say it's not a bad tool to get help from. Um, uh, like technology is there, and technology is always there to help us. But having said that, I will I will recommend that as I said earlier, try to make your personal statement as the as the name states personal. 
it should be built on your experiences because when you write something which is built on your experiences um then it felt natural to the person who's reading it and uh, as far as i know the people who are reading on the us cfp side can differentiate between a computer generated and a personally uh, narr a personal narration of someone's experiences so take the take the examples from chat gpt how it should be written what should be the key points to take in consider uh, consideration into take this as an as, as a bullet point but don't just take all of it from there because chat gpt does not know the experiences you have gone through just take that as an example and write according to your own experiences and that will go a long way comparative to if you take everything from chat gpt I actually have to add on to that as well. It's a very good point. So here in our advising department, we actually sometimes, you know, help students with their essays, not with the Fulbright essays. That's not something we help with because we host the Fulbright program here. But there's other essays, like for example, if they're applying independently or the or the common app as if undergraduate. And we have this term for an essay which a student just has chat GPT write. We call that a soulless essay, an essay without a soul. Because chat GPT, you, when you write your essay, you will have your own personal experiences, which will which reflect why you're going or why you're choosing a certain field of study, what, motiv what motivates you, what is your passion, your drive behind it. Whereas chat GPT might just say, I, I'm passionate about this and this and this. It'll just stress upon one factor multiple times. Like I'm passionate about one particular field and it'll just keep on talking about that over and over again. And we, we then fail to see where is the personalized touch? Where is the personal example in this essay? So yeah, just to, just to add on to that point. Um, so again, I second that, that you, know, you can use it as an example. You can maybe use it to refine your essay, but that personal touch will be missing. Or in other words, the soul of your essay will not be there if you completely depend on uh, chat GPT. Um, and uh, following uh, up with the questions, um, we have uh, I have some of my own pre questions prepared for you regarding the GRE, and there's some we can incorporate one of the questions in the in the chat box, which the audience has access to. Um, so for chat uh, for GRE, um, how long? Did you give the GRE, yes or no? If you did, how long did you study for it? What was your study style? And what type of materials did you use? Um, where did you obtain that material? Um, in terms of expenses, some, some of our audience members, they have limited budget for, for GRE books and whatnot. So supplies, what type of supplies did you use? What would you consider a good score for the GRE? Um, and um, yeah, so more on the GRE, good scores, uh, what type of um, supplies, resources did you use? Yeah. Um, before starting on the GRE, I would like to uh, give the disclaimer that when I give GRE, GRE was a little different. I think they modified the GRE process uh, recently. Uh, I hope the information is which I'm giving is the same, but a little bit process has been different. Maybe the uh, questionnaire or something like that has been different. When I we did the GRE at that time, there was three body marks exam uh, that have, we have to do divided between quant, verbal, and analyticals. Two quant section, two verbal section, one surprise section, um, uh, which can be quant or, or verbal depending upon the upon the upon your performance and at uh, the time of the or the algorithm of the test. Um, and the analytical part where you have to just uh, write an essay. Uh, I think a couple of essays, two essays. So uh, yeah, starting from the basics, I gave GRE 2017. Uh, I remember I started preparing initially when I was in university, but I didn't give like full attention to it because I was going through my final year. I have to complete my final year project. I have to write the thesis. Um, it was like a tough time. Uh, following that, I actually, uh, when I started preparing for GRE like full time, giving my total attention, I take three months I, I i remember uh maybe it's uh, roughly it's like three months i took to prepare uh as i had a little bit of a challenge uh on the verbal side and my quant side was uh, uh, better and that i get to know when i give the on the gre official website there is practice tests two practice tests are uh, available and i give a uh, one of the practice tests and find out where i stand before preparing and 
I had better understanding of quant because my quant score was higher than my verbal score. So I divided my attention between them. I knew that I have to put more effort into verbal rather than in uh, the quant. And quant, how much score I, I am wishing to get. And on that level, how much effort I need to put, how much more advanced quant questions I need to tackle uh, if I need to score more in the quant side. And how much compensation on the quant side can be done, uh, on the verbal side can be done on the quant side, how much I can increase my score in the quant side. And then that can be passed out from the lack of verbal uh, skill set or my my understanding of the, uh, of the verbal sections. So that I I made a plan. I for the three months I studied. I put I would say sixty percent or sixty five percent effort on the verbal side, uh, and the rest on the on the quant side. And then uh, my exam was in November, if I'm not wrong, at that time. Uh, or uh, yeah, I don't remember the dates, but uh, uh, I performed uh, relatively well. Uh, my score was not like great. It was I think uh, around the three ten. Uh, and uh, I again for I scored better in quant comparative to verbal. But again, which degree are you going for? That also can, uh, can is dependent. As as uh, were asked, what is a good score? I think in engineering, given I will only give my back uh, from my background in engineering the reference from the engineering uh, university. Three hundred plus at that time was considered good for getting admitted into uh, so, uh, most of the universities. Not the best of the universities. Uh, but the more and more you go higher, you can get uh, selected into better in the 10 universities of the US. I was 310 plus, uh, somewhere 312. So I got uh, no problem in getting admission to North Carolina State University, uh, which is uh, 310 plus is considered a good score in the, in, in the uh, engineering side. And then on the on engineering side, the quant matters a lot. If the quantitative uh, score is higher, then yes, they know that you have the background of the mathematics and you have uh, an engineering degree to pursue, so your score is good. But if you're going some of my other Fulbright uh, friends who were in the other degree, which were not quantitative degree, they needed better score in the verbal side as well. Uh, some of the degrees require a good score in the analytical side as well. So you need to know what you're going for, and based on that, you can research. Uh, I think US EFP helps a lot. There is a lot of information available on their web, on their Facebook page, on their on the platform, there is the people you can consult with, they have the advisors. Um, and on top of that, you can also, I remember I also gave one practice exam at USCFD uh, office in F6, I think, um, in Islamabad, uh, when I was studying in my university, I, uh, and it was like free of charge, there's no cost to give that test at that time. And I just uh, registered myself, I went there and gave this test because they give you the whole environment where you will give the test. And you just get the feeling of how much overwhelming it can be, how much stress and pressure it can induce if you are in that environment, and how to tackle that in the future. That I will highly recommend if it's if this uh, opportunity is still available. I think go back and second on that. Uh, what what is the opportunity available on that point? Then you can use it if you are available. Uh, if that's available to you. Um, and then uh, yeah, uh, the last thing would be I would say that uh, uh, the material on the material side I used the uh, had a five pound book. Uh, I initially took some of the book from the library of my university, like physical form, uh, and then I studied on them. But I got most of the material from the from the PDFs, and the PDFs were mostly available by the seniors online. Some of them are available online for free. Some of them are available by the seniors, so they shared with me, and uh, I did not pay for any book in my preparation for the GRE. Um, but some of my friends, they use the GRE books from the second-hand book bookstores. In Islamabad, there is a couple of book book bookstores which, which have second-hand books. And uh, they are really economical and uh, actually they are the same material which you wanted to study. So it depends what you want. If you want a brand new book or you can study from a, from a PDF, you are good with studying with a PDF. Or if you can find a, a, find a second-hand book on the second-hand book, book selling shops, that's also a possibility. So the material is not, uh, I would say, from my experience, a thing which needs to be considered from the monetary perspective because the material can be available. Uh, free of cost, limited amount of money can be used to buy it out and then prepare for it. Um, and as I said, most of the practice tests are, tests are free on the GRE website or on the USCFP uh, office. So you can practice them. And uh, uh, the GRE exam cost right now, I don't remember what it is right now, but at uh, my time it was relatively 
to be high, but that is the cost that you have to bear. I think the uh, right at that time was also giving some initiative, uh, had some initiative which says uh, that it might not be or for some specific high achieving students who create something higher than a specific number, they can uh, apply for a reimbursement. At that time, that was the case, uh, but I don't, I don't know right now. So this is the whole like the whole, uh, whole, whole uh, points of the big picture of the GRE. So yeah. All right, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, and furthermore, could you speak a little bit about, so once you got to North Carolina University, can you talk a little bit about the education you experienced there, the classroom environment, the laboratory environment, how what, the facilities that were available to you as a graduate student? Tell us about university life. Yeah, uh, North Carolina uh, State University is like a really good university. Um, uh, this uh, this area it's, it is situated in Raleigh, North Carolina. Raleigh is the capital of the North Carolina state. Uh, the university is surrounded by two other very good universities uh, called uh, Duke University in Durham and uh, uh, North Carolina uh, University of North Carolina UNC uh, is also there. So they all of them together uh, make a thing called uh, Triangle Research Area uh, and because they collaborate with each other a lot. So because of that, it was a very in, uh, highly uh, diversified area with a lot of students, a lot of people studying. So this the environment was great from that perspective. You have people from all over the world. And uh, then following that, in the first uh, week of the university start, we had uh, orientation sessions in which Fulbright is given. So we uh, the in our university, the uh, the, uh, the logo of the university was Wolf, Wolfpack. So we all were the part of the Wolfpack uh, community when we joined the university. So when the orientation happened, they divided the new coming student into small uh, Wolfpacks and then give them the numbers on which uh, uh, they will be uh, grouped together and then go through the orientation stuff. Fulbright is uh, considered really highly in North Carolina State University. They really respect the Fulbright grads coming from across the world because Fulbright is a global program. So everybody who come from a Fulbright uh, program, they are gathered together in one group called Wolfpack One. The first first group of the whole orientation is given to the Fulbright. So this is a really, uh, you feel really uh, proud that you are given this with number one uh, rank in a group of uh, hundreds or thousands of people. And uh, the university knows that you're a high achieving people and the and the program you're coming under is a reputable program across the globe. So they that that's that's the reverence you get out of the program, and that really uh, makes you feel proud. Uh, that was the start, and then following that, uh, the university has some orientation week, and then following that, the class starts. Uh, depending upon what kind of degree you are doing, like let's I say from the engineering background. I had uh, uh, to choose between my specific credit hours, which was 12 credit hours minimum. So I have to take at least three courses in a semester. Uh, I can take more. I can take up to 20 and minimum 12. So I have to decide what is the workload balance I wanted to take care of. And then after that, I uh, I have some lab work for, for a specific course. There, there's supposed to be a corresponding lab work you have to complete. So you can decide what, what kind of courses you want to take. And the the classes can range from like eight in the morning to the five in the evening. So whenever you choose a course or register for it, you know what the timings are. If they are uh, not uh, clashing with other uh, requirements of yours, so that's also uh, very very good. Then the university has an extremely good extracurricular activity program. Uh, we had a gymnasium, a newly built gymnasium that was amazing. Uh, it has every kind of sport that I can imagine. The gymnasium was uh, built in, in an Olympic uh, games-oriented fashion, so every sport that is in the Olympics is uh, is available in the in the gymnasium, so that they can prepare their athletes for the future. And you are more than welcome to join in the programs. There is classes uh, when you register for your uh, for your educational classes. The, the registration for the extracurricular activity class is also open. I took swimming. I took tennis. I took golf. Uh, uh, golf there. Uh, I also took classes of squash. Uh, so these are the classes that help me a lot to learn about uh, more new sports, rules, regulation, how to play. 
And I still uh, am playing a couple of these games because I started there, I got in front of them, I started playing regularly, and it was so, so, so good. So they help you a lot in that sense as well. Uh, and all these opportunities are uh, covered in your tuition fees, which is covered by the full price. So you are actually having a very amazing journey ahead of you, which you can explore to the maximum. And Fulbright does not stop you from anything which is creating and adding value to your personality, to your curriculum, to your development, and they always, uh, uh, always vouch for it. So uh, from my experience, uh, this was an amazing time in North Carolina State University. Uh, the classes were amazing, the lab work was good, the teachers were uh, kind, and uh, the extracurricular was amazing. So yeah, overall, great experience. Um, all right, tell, thank you, Tala. Uh, tell me, you did your undergraduate from Pakistan, right? Just to clarify. Okay, uh, a little bit of compare and contraction. Undergraduate in Pakistan, that classes versus masters in USA and those classes. How would you compare and contrast the differences between these two? Yeah, the, the difference is huge, actually. Um, uh, from the perspective of uh, learning curve, I will say. In Pakistan, I would not generalize, but I would say like mostly the classes are based on the structure where you are in a feel like you are in a lot of pressure. You have to perform. And uh, the structure is built on uh, twice we had professionals which are like a bi by semester exams, like two times we have to give exams in the, in the semester, then we have to give the finals, we have to prepare the reports, uh, we have to get to the assignments, homeworks, uh, projects, and everything to combine with like a really heavy pressure intensive uh, structure uh, or uh, environment in Pakistan. Well, if you go to, uh, on the other side in America, I, I took 16 credit hours as well in one of the semesters, like four courses. Um, the classes are actually 90 minutes long, um, comparative to Pakistan, which was 60 minutes of that time, 90 minutes long class. And in a 90 minute long class, we have uh, two breaks where we have to go, go out and just calm down our minds. And at the same time, we are not like struggling on any level in terms of understanding the professor, communication wise, questions. Uh, the, uh, the learning is more like a uh, it's kind of, they are teaching you by, by holding your hand and taking you across the whole curve of the learning. And at the same time, there was no intensive work. They, in the third week of the, of the class, they give you a project, which is due by the end of the, of the semester. And you have like the whole semester in front of you. They assign a specific PA for the class, a teaching assistant. And that teaching assistant is available to you all the semester, you can text him, you can email him, uh, you, uh, you can communicate your problems with him, you can discuss the homework, you can discuss the course lecture problems, you can discuss the project, everything is open for uh, of talking to him. Then with professor, you can set up appointments. I specifically want to mention here one example. In one of the semesters, I was going through a course called Power Electronics, a very challenging course in, in the electric in the power field, uh, if the people from the uh, engineering background are here, they can understand. Um, and that course has, it, it, it was really advanced for me at one point, because the background I was coming from, but I had a very basic and rudimentary knowledge, and I was, I was, I was being challenged by that course. So I, I, I set it up and I wondered with my TA, and my TA gave me an, uh, an understanding of what, what I can improve, but it was not helping. So I emailed my professor. And within, within a week, I got an, a response from my professor of an appointment, set it up with him for one hour, where we go through the problems I'm facing, what kind of psychological impacts it's going to be creating, what kind of uh, uh, efforts I can make, what kind of efforts I'm early, earlier making, what he can do to help me out, or the final uh, thing, would it be best for me to drop this course? All these things were considered, and dropping a course is not considered an fail grade in the US. Um, you can drop, in North Carolina University, you can drop a course till six weeks into a class because they give you the ability to come to the class, talk to the people, get to know the environment, and then learn and then see if this is what you wanted to learn from this class or this is what the uh, what you were expecting. So that was also a years in option. And we go through the all of, all of it. They given me uh, he, gave, he uh, talk, asked me to talk to uh, TA and take some extra lectures with him 
uh, in my leisure time. And I did that. And eventually, I passed the course with a very good score. And I understand most of the bits. And I was able to complete my project in a very good manner. So I would say that this example is just, just generally tells you what is the difference between two educational systems is. Some of the, in Pakistan, most of the time what we have is, what we have is, is that we do not have this communication with the professors readily available and it's not promoted that much. Uh, which where we can even go and tell them that what the problems you're going through in a semester. And when I was studying in class in Pakistan, it's also the problem that once you take a course, you have to be in the course. If you drop it, there has to be a very concrete reason for dropping it. And dropping it will be considered a drop in your CV. And it will always be mentioned in your CV. And it will be considered equal to a fail, which actually scares a lot of people from taking initiative of talking to professors and saying that we want to move this course from the next year or next semester and don't want to take it now. So I would say this is a lot of, these are a lot of differences you feel in the new study in the American system. But on some levels, Pakistan system also helps you in taking that pressure. For me, the American systems was not that much uh, uh, that much pressure intensive that I crumbled. Because in Pakistan, I was so much trained to, uh, to study in that way that when I, when I went there, everything became very natural for me and the learning curve was very smooth for me. So, yeah, I would say the whole, both of the systems have their pros and cons, but yeah, American system was a bit, a bit better in communication and stuff. Thank you very much. Um, now we have a question. The first part I'll answer how to effectively research degree programs, Google. You Google which degree programs you want. That's as simple as that. But the second question, which is actually a good question, is that uh, is it possible to switch programs when you have already when you already got admitted into a university and you went to the university and you decide that maybe you want to change from, let's say, chemical engineering to electrical engineering? Is that flexibility afforded to you? Um, so uh, I I will uh, answer this question because I have some experience in that in that background. So when I started my course in uh, electric power system engineering, I wanted to study the uh, the mostly growing field in the world right now: AI, data science, statistical analysis, mathematics. Um, and I was intrigued by it because one of the courses I was taking in my university was in the first semester was the data analytics for power systems. And it does not talk about the power, uh, like conventional electrical engineering as well. It only talks about the, the financial side of the power plant, how to make money out of a power plant, how to, how to optimize the power plant, how to get the, uh, the, the uh, how to schedule a, a power plant and all that is highly data intensive. Following that course, I really think, uh, started having liking for the data science and I wanted to grow in that field and I knew my career was in this field is much better because uh, because the way the, the world is evolving, everybody wants to be hire someone who has experience in data, data science and uh, can implement it into a real world problem. Uh, so I it took the initiative. It's all about your initiative. So I took the initiative. I talked to my professors. I talked to the second school I wanted to study in, uh, the mathematics school. And uh, I took the courses. I talked to Fulbright. Fulbright always assigns you an advisor in US. When you go there, it's IA, IE advisors that have been assigned to you. And I talked to my advisor, and she said uh, that uh, uh, it depends. Do you want to really change your degree, or do you want to do a minor in your degree? For me, I wanted to do a minor in my degree. I didn't want to change my degree. So I, for me, it was no act. act an extra new um, uh, document to be signed or approval to be taken because I was just taking a minor. So they let me go to the, uh, so they let me take my uh, take my new courses unless until they are within the bounds of 20 credit hours a semester. And as I told you, if you take three credit hours, uh, sorry, three, uh, three courses, 12 credit hours a semester, you can complete your degree very easily because your degree is spanned across two years and the credit hours you, you have to complete are actually divided in such a way that you have to just take 12 credit hours and three courses. But as I wanted to do a minor, I started adding more credit hours and taking uh, the courses I like to do and I wanted to uh, have knowledge of and added them as my minors. So I mostly do like 16 credit hours, 
uh, 15 thread hours, 15 thread hours, sometimes 20 thread hours, and just that's why because I wanted to learn that uh, that field. So I took statistical analysis, I took uh, data science, I took uh, dynamic programming, um, I took uh, uh, mathematics of uh, AI, mathematics design AI. So these kind of courses I all took them because I wanted to learn them. So Fulbright was not posing that at all because they were paying for my tuition fees for 25 hours a, a, a semester. And uh, if I wanted to take only all, they are happy to, uh, to let me help. Uh, but there is also some of the people I know who change their degrees from an engineering background to a non-engineering background to uh, from a, uh, from one uh, scope of field to another scope of field. But for that, they had to go through the IIB advisor and get approval from the Fulbright itself. But in that situation, I cannot say the what is the process. Some people justify why they are switching the course and the justification is something which is highly required. If the Fulbright understands the justification, they approve. If they don't understand the justification, they won't approve. So it all depends upon what you are, ex what, how you are uh, elaborating what you expect, uh, why you wanted to do that. So your, uh, uh, your request needs a solid ground on why you are changing your field. All right, thank you very much. Um, so um, what, can you tell us, us, us a little bit about the research which you were involved in? So in your master's, um, as part of your final thesis or as part of the research which you were conducting with your professors, what was that research? Was that on the grounds of uh, electrical management? And if so, what was that research like? What was it like researching alongside with the professor? How were the some of the hands-on activities, the hands-on experiments you were involved in and so on? So in my program, uh, the thing was uh, uh, a research called a uh, capstone project. We have to complete a capstone project excuse me, with, an, uh, with an, an ongoing companies. The companies come to the, to the campus and they offer projects they wanted to work on. So they take students and you work literally with industry to complete a project. So that was my project requirement. That's not everywhere. That's just my pro uh, my program was like this. So in the capstone project, uh, I was working on a battery storage uh, uh, system, uh, uh, how we can have an efficient battery storage system and how we can dispatch that storage power in optimally into a uh, competitive power market. Because in US, the power market is decentralized market and it's a competitive market where the prices of uh, where the producer bids uh, uh, the prices and the distributor buys it. So this is a kind of a trading activity there. Uh, power is traded as a, as a commodity there. So that's why the the, the batteries that has been dispatched into the uh, into the market, if they are dispatched optimally in an optimal time of uh, time in the in, in the power market, then they can make the most out of it. So the profit can maximize. That was my project to maximize the profit for a battery storage system. Uh, and optimally dispatch it from the dispatching perspective as well. Uh, and that project I did with a company called Booth and Associates. And the project uh, and the company was a North Carolina-based company, a small consultancy. They uh, they bring this project. I liked it. Uh, there was nine to ten companies that came to our campus, from Schneider Electric to uh, to Booth and Associates to uh, I also remember uh, companies like uh, um, GE. Uh, companies like uh, uh, Duke Energy, um, which is a very big company in that area because they control the power for the east, uh, southeast area. Uh, and yeah, there's all companies came presented their product. We have given like a couple of weeks to decide which project we want to do. We preference, we give preferences to one to three and build up a proposal. We have to build a proposal for them, for the company. So it's, very interesting way of learning how in industry real world the thing goes. They keep it very uh, practical. It's really practical approach. They don't give it like university versus industry. No, you have to perform exactly if you are an employee of that company. You have to build a proposal. You have to submit the proposal. The managers will go through the proposal. They, if they like it, they question you. They send you, uh, they send you uh, an invite for the interview. If they like you in the interview, they give you the project. And once they give you the project, Every month we had uh, we had a meeting with the company managers. We can go there. We can ask questions. We can give our suggestions, 
and from the lower uh, manager level to the higher manager managerial level, all of them are involved because there is like a growth initiative for the for the new students, and they hire at that time as well because they were hiring most of the people who are working with them. Uh, if uh, you are on the not on the fullback journey, the other students who are not on the fullback journey, they were getting hired by the same company where they were working for the project. So this was a really good uh, opportunity, and I worked on this project. And uh, my project was mostly based on research and MATLAB simulation. So what we did was is that we gathered the data, we uh, we built up uh, uh, built the simulation for the uh, for the packing storage system. We also had the power prices in the market. We did some uh, statistical analysis of the power prices. Which time of the year the prices are more volatile? At which time of the year the prices are more uh, uh, are on the higher side, what is the seasonality in the prices, which is the best time for charging the battery, what is the best time to dispatch the battery into the system. So yeah, overall this was the project I was working on and uh, yeah, it uh, it involved a lot of research and a lot of uh, MATLAB coding. All right, so uh, we have a question from one of the audience members. Um, on what criteria does Fulbright basis selection? So basically, if you want to be selected in the Fulbright scholarships, what are the things you can do to maximize your chances on getting selected? Yeah, I would say um, about the experiences I had and the stories I've heard of my Fulbright mates and uh, colleagues, it's all about how well you present yourself to in front of the panel uh, who are reading your application. Just imagine the first barrier in the process of getting selected, selected is the application. So how good or how well you put yourself forward in front of the people who are reading your application. There's a people, there's a panel uh, reading your application. So just imagine if you are presenting yourself, what is the best possible way to present it? The best possible way to present yourself is your personal statement. To tell them what your journey is, what your ambitions are, where you want to go, uh, where you come from, that is very important. The second is your SOP, your study objectives. What do you want to do? Why you want uh, Fulbright? What do you want to achieve out of Fulbright? What you can contribute, come back to the society, coming back to the society. How how the US culture you are going to get used to? Or what is the, what is, why, why it is attractive to you to study in US? These are the questions that are like, basic level and uh, questions that needs to be addressed in your in your uh, personal statement and your study objectives. Because as a reading person, they are looking at these uh, prospectives. They wanted to know in their in their mindset what is you wanted out of this program. And these are some of the basic questions they have in mind, whose answer they're looking for in your statements. So I would say, Put your personal statement study objectives as your primary and most important task to complete the application. Following that uh, reference, uh, your reference letters, and along with it, your GRE. Your GRE should be your preference, but I'm keeping it as a second preference. First is your study objective and personal statement because your personal statement and study objective can get you even selected, and then the pullback asks you to give the GRE again. So that has happened in the past. I've seen it. So I would say that uh, uh, if you are uh, want, uh, really ambitious to join the, uh, the, uh, the the community of Fulbright and be selected for the Fulbright program, keep your study objective and personal statement as your priority and prepare them, proofread them multiple times by yourself, by your friends who, who, who you can go to, by the people who have experience maybe in Fulbright or maybe generally they are your teachers, for your mentors who have better understanding uh, of what can be go in which direction, and then they can give you some little bit of feedbacks, so that 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 will be helpful. One of the things I used to do, and whenever I write my personal statement, I sleep over it, and in the morning I again read it. So I take a day between writing it and reading it, so that the next day my perspective is a little bit changed. I can see the mistakes quite clearly, and I can also see that where the narration is not making sense at all. So I can make, may change a little bit of uh, the, uh, the sentences from here and there and make the narration more smooth and more continuous. So yeah, that's one of the feedbacks I also have. All right, thank you. 
Um, and uh, just a, a quick um, clarification. So when you got the full, when you were selected for the Fulbright Scholarship, what it, what were the things that it covered? Like it covered your tuition or tuition plus living or even what were the things that were covered when you were awarded the Fulbright Scholarship? Um, and this is for, to help the audience understand that when they go to the United States, how much money or how much funding should they have with them if uh, they were to be selected for the Fulbright Scholarship. So what does the Fulbright Scholarship cover? Um, and then what would be the things that you would need to cover yourself? Yeah, so when you go for the Fulbright Program, um, from the day of selection, uh, you got selected and you're invited for the, for the orientation session in Islamabad, I had. Uh, everything is covered at that place forward for your whole journey. Your uh, orientation is covered, your flight to US and from US is covered. And I'm talking about one time going to the program and once coming back from the program, not in the middle any uh, family visits are not covered. Um, then your flights are covered. Following that, you land in the, uh, in the university area and uh, you get, uh, you register with IIE in the start and then you get your first paycheck which is uh, for your uh, daily expenses and for your laptop and books allowance. They give you a laptop slash books allowance first time you reach there. Then next year, or next semester, they also give you books allowance, then following semester and the following semester. So all four semesters that book, books allowance was first time you reach there is a laptop allowance. Um, and then uh, I remember uh, that you also have, oh, obviously you have your tuition fees covered. As I told you, in my case, 20 credit hours were covered. Minimum requirement was 12. The fee for 12 and 20 are the same. So Fulbright was paying the, 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 base, the basic for the for the 12, but you can take up to 20 because the fee remains the same. Uh, so they were paying for, for, I would say, 20 credit hours uh, uh, in, in the university. Your health insurance is covered in the in the university. Your extracurricular is, uh, uh, is also covered in the university uh, university um, uh, tuition fee. Uh, that's also in the university uh, pays for. And uh, then following that, uh, your Fulbright also pays for any kind of uh, um, natural or accidental situations. For example, when I was there in North Carolina, we were hit by a hurricane. I think it was Florence Hurricane in 2018. And at that time, uh, the Fulbright given us, I think, 600 euros, uh, dollars, sorry, nearly to uh, to relocate ourselves for a couple of weeks, maybe one week or, or so we relocated ourselves because the hurricane was coming in that direction. So they are very up to date with what's going on and how they have to help out their uh, participants. Um, also, for, for following that, I was a person who got graduated in COVID. Uh, in 2020, I was uh, graduating, and it was the peak time of COVID, and the US was the center of the COVID. There was no uh, flights back home, so there has to be repatriation flights from Pakistan embassy. And when they were getting scheduled, they were helping us a lot in scheduling them. And on top of that, we have to stay two more months in the US compared to our program limit. My program limit was May and I came back in August nearly. So as we were staying more, they had to get our visa renewed, uh, sorry, extended, not renewed, visa extended. They had given us two more months living expenses so that we can afford our rent. Rent some stuff. So that was it. As uh, Zubair asked me, how much money you want to take with you? When I was going, in my mind, I didn't want to take anything. But I, you always need to take some some money with you so that you have something for the rainy, rainy day or something for the difficult situation when something you have figured out. And especially when you land there, you don't have Fulbright money. You have to register for Fulbright. Uh, you register with IIE to get the Fulbright money because this is the whole process, like whole administrative process that has to go through. So your advisor contacts you from IIE when you land. If you have to give all the documents to him, fill out an application, and then set up a bank account in the U.S., and once you set up a bank account in the US, give the bank account details to her. And this all can take a week, maybe, sometime. For me, it took a week. So for that week, you may need money to sustain your life. Um, I paid my first rent from my pocket. I paid my uh, basic day-to-day -day meals from my, from my pocket. But they all got reimbursed because they all, you actually supposed to get that money 
but that might come one week because you have to set it up the whole system, the whole bank account and everything. So once you set it up, then you can, um, uh, you, you actually have that money back. So it's not the money you need, it's the money you need for, for the actual money to come to your account uh, from that perspective. And then if you want to have a personal trips, then that has to come from your own pocket. If you want to travel across Europe, you, uh, sorry, I'm saying Europe, US, if you want to travel across US, if you want to travel uh, uh, to your friends, if you want to travel back to Pakistan, uh, that all can come to your, from your pocket. And that depends again it's coming from your savings from the corporate money you're giving, uh, giving you or your personal funding. So that's dependent on how you want to deal with the situation. All right. And I think we have maybe time to squeeze in one more question because we're coming up on the hour. Um, one of the attendants is asking, uh, uh, you talked a lot about the Fulbright experience already, but a uh, good question is, what did you do apart from your studies when you just wanted to unwind, when you wanted to relax? What were some of your activities which you could take part in other than, you know, university life? Um, we had a very good community of Fulbrighters. I had a lot of international friends from my university. Uh, I got my driving license when I reached there in the first week. So I had a, I, I got myself a, a car. We used to go for, for, for trips. There was amazing national parks in America, across America. Uh, where we were living in Raleigh, North Carolina, there was Asheville, there is uh, Hanging Rock Gardens. They are beautiful places to do hiking, uh, nature, uh, go through that. Um, as I said, uh, the, there was uh, uh, this uh, uh, South Carolina is nearby, Virginia is very close by, even Washington DC was close, like four hours drive, so you usually go there. Uh, so traveling was one big part of it. That Fulbright organizes every year uh, the new coming graduate uh, people from Pakistan gathers together at one specific location for an orientation inside US. That happens usually in October, after first month of university. And then we in our time we went to Wisconsin. Wisconsin is a beautiful state up north. Um, and uh, we had so much fun because we gathered around, we were going for uh, we were having like dinners, we were dancing, we were having fun, we were communicating, we were playing games. So that is also, also U.S. universities are great in terms of uh, their sports teams. They are crazy about sports. So NBA, uh, NBA is national, but we have college basket, basketball games, we have March Madness. Uh, Duke was when the Duke was playing North Carolina due to the very good basketball team. We had a huge uh, rivalry there, so we used to we, we get free tickets. Students are the first one to get tickets, so it's first come first serve basis. If you are a student, you get an email. You register for the for the for the games. So all that was like there was a lot of things to do to just release your stress to have fun. And uh, I would highly recommend if you are there, just don't focus on the study. These things actually makes you much better person, develops you a lot, and you learn so much that you can implement anywhere in the world, and then and then you can uh, have a very very successful life. All right, thank you very much, Salah. I think uh, we'll just uh, call that a wrap. Um, for those who still have questions, um, if you go on our website, educationusa.pk. You can go into the section of upcoming events. Some of you have questions about details of the personal statement or the statement of purpose. We have separate workshops regarding the tricks and uh, tips regarding the how to craft the perfect just, uh, statement of purpose. So you can register for those events. We have in-person events in Lahore, Karachi, and Islamabad. And we have virtual events as well, such as the one we're having right now. So questions related to the uh, statement of purpose, uh, specific workshops, you can sign up for those at our website, educationusa.pk, and then go into the upcoming events tab. All right. Um, 
And uh, if you have any other questions which are left unanswered, we won't be able to get to them in this session because we are running short on time. But if we will have other sessions regarding the Fulbright journey, um, again, in person and virtual, and hopefully if not in this session, they can get answered in those, in those later sessions. All right. Um, lastly, I just want to really take a moment to thank uh, Talha. Uh, thank you so much for taking out the time to answer these questions, um, sharing your journey. I'm sure it was a very, very insightful session for everyone here. Um, and um, yeah, uh, uh, any final remarks uh, before we close the session, Talha? Um, thank you very much, Umar. That's a really helpful. Um, I'm really, really excited for the new applicants and uh, hopefully some really nice uh, candidates got selected and uh, uh, make Pakistan proud in America like us. And uh, I would just wanted to say here, if uh, any of you have any other questions, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, like my name is Tal 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 and I, you can find me on the uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, I have a full bright alumni uh, written on my on my profile. So just send me a message there. I am um, I usually reply on my LinkedIn quite uh, frequently. So if you have any specific questions, just reach out to me. I can I can give you a feedback. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Gentala, and uh, everyone. Thank you for taking the time out today. Uh, be well, um, and hopefully we'll see you in some of the upcoming sessions. All right. Thank you so much, Agintala. Thank you. Bye. All right. Take care, everyone. Lapis.